Hey, everybody. It is Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Friday indeed, guys. Even though every single day feels like the weekend. Yeah. There's truth to that. This is... This is weird times, man. It is definitely weird times. Do I have office hours today? Um, you know what? Yeah, let's let's do office hours um, three to four. Hello, everybody. Welcome. We'll get started here pretty soon. I got this mic um, from Amazon. It's called the Yeti Nano, I believe. Hello, welcome. Hello, robot Sean. Guys, I'm glad it's Friday. I don't know, it's strange, like... I feel busier. I don't know if you guys feel the same way. It's like we're not going as many places every day, going to different classes, but it feels busier. Like, I feel more tired. Yeah, thank goodness it's Friday. Can't relate. <laughs> really? You can? I feel like work just takes a little bit more time. Yeah. Are people abiding by stay at home in the Big Apple? Some of you went back to the city, right? Motivation takes a hit. It does, when you're just at home. I think everybody's staying home. It seems like it. At least around where I live, there's hardly anybody out. All quiet on the southern front. All right, guys. Um, people in Arizona aren't very compliant. Give it some time. Give it some time. It'll take off there, too, I think. Okay. Uh, we're going to get started because we have to end a little bit earlier today because I, I got to go for the 334 lecture at 1 p.m. So we're probably going to get out of here close to um, 1245. All right, so we'll run a little shorter. But even though we're shorter on time, I want to start today with a story because we all need a little bit of levity in these times. So I'm just going to give you a cute little story. Yeah, 334 is also on Twitch. This story is about... Um, 
my nephew Colton. I call it the turdweed story. All right. So, um, my nephew Colton, he's the son of my sister, Hillary. And Hillary, one of the activities she's doing with the kids during this quarantine is she's drawing them pictures. So she started by drawing like Spider-Man, Batman, um, and like, and, and, and the kids love it, right? And so Colton is four and, or maybe he's five, I should remember, but he is into Pokemon right now. And so now my sister, Hillary is drawing them Pokemon as well as superheroes. So she draws like Squirtle and Charmander, you know, if you know some of these Pokemon, right? And um, so, so Colton tells her the other day this Pokemon that he wants her to draw. And he's like, it's, it's Turdweed. And Hillary's like sending us messages like, do you guys know who Turdweed is? And, like, I was into Pokemon back in the day, you know, like, Pokemon Yellow, like, I was in grade school. And, like, that's, that's all I wanted to do. I was on the Game Boy Color playing Pokemon, so I knew, like, all the original 150, and now I know there's way more. There's, like, a thousand or something. But, um, so I do, I do some Googling, and I'm looking for this, like, turd week. Yeah, okay, okay, see? And so there's a Pokemon called Turtwig, which sounds like you know, Turdweed, right? I mean, he's four years old. But, so I look up a picture of Turtwig, which it looks like a little plant-eating thing with a leaf on its head or something. I don't know, it's cute. And I, and Hillary already checked with Colton, and it's not, it's not Turtwig. That's not the Pokemon he's talking about. So he's like, no, 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 it's Turdweed. And, um, and it, and it throws a boomerang and uh it, it's like it's like a gerbil or something and we're like what are you talking about are you talking because i know the original pokemon cubone has like a boomerang attack but that i don't think he's talking about cubone that's like totally different so um what i decided to do is i decided to come up with turdweed the pokemon so follow me please i'm going to show you the whole evolution Let's go here. This is taking a little second to load. Okay, okay. Okay, and th and this is what I started with, guys. Can you guys see this? Is your screen working? <clears throat> I decided to try to draw turd turdwig. All right, and um, so I started with this, and I put, you know, some eyes on it, and then it's like a weed, right? So I, I put like a little plant on it, and, uh, but remember, he said it was like a, like a gerbil or something, so I had to, I had to add this, um, so I don't know, it has like a turd-like appendage. And then um, he throws a boomerang, right? So there's there's the boomerang. And then I added the, you know, like this official background. So turdweed, right? Then I even have like, uh, he has like this metal thing that like, uh, so the next step is to move him down there. But I mean, that must be what my nephew's talking about, right? I mean, that's obviously... Um... So I just wanted to share that with you. I hope you, you get a little joy out of it. We all need a little uh, levity in these times. So that's turdweed. That's the turdweed story. All right. So let's get on to what we're doing today in digital controls. <laughs> Need to use turn wheat for a 340 problem. <laughs> All right, guys. Today we're talking about the regulator problem, and I have a couple of pictures here. These are all regulator control problems. 
and I'll explain uh, how these work. Let's watch these videos though. Let's turn this down. Pause the music. Uh, so uh, a regulator problem is trying to hold something in place basically. So this is a regulator problem because we're trying to hold the ball at the center of this plate. And so the control is all trying to keep it fixed there. So I'm just gonna go quickly through. This is a regulator problem. I'm trying to balance this, uh, it's kind of like a BB-8, right? I'm trying to balance this ball on top of a, or trying to balance the robot on top of a soccer ball. So it's got like these wheels that jitter back and forth. And so this is regulating the position of the robot, trying to keep it to uh, stay on top. Let's do this one. This one I think is, is really cool. Um, if you're doing a hands-on graduate project, this might be doable. This is a regulator problem trying to keep the, uh, that ping pong ball at the center. So it measures the distance from the ping pong ball using this ultrasonic range sensor. And then it just has a servo motor down here that rotates and it moves that linkage to change the slope here to try to settle it in at that. So this is also like regulating the position of the ball, trying to hold it right there. And then one last one, this is a regulation of a double inverted pendulum trying to balance it. So even if you disturb it, it uh, stands straight up. There's even videos of like a triple pendulum. So you can go down a YouTube hole and um, look at all this stuff. But so let's define the regulator problem here. And so the state, so we're starting to use state space control and state space is great for regulator problems. So this is like the problem you usually start with when you're, I mean, we won't do anything as complicated as this yet, but this style of problem is what you start with. So the regulator problem is this. Oh no, is my pen, is my pen giving out? Oh, like in class, I would just pull out a piece of paper. Mm. What does this mean? Do I have to restart my... Uh... Let me think. How about I restart my surface really quick? Because sometimes that fixes it. Oops. Sometimes that fixes the pen. We don't really have a choice. I mean... Okay. Let's just... Let's restart the surface. Okay, yeah. In the meantime... We can talk about the test a little bit. So I think the test average was like a... The average, so there was 44 points total and the average was 33.8 out of 44. So what's that? Eight divided by forty-four. So the average was seventy-seven percent. So this this is exam one that we're talking about. You didn't know? Are you in the, are you in the class? Uh, this is this is the test we took. So yeah, the average was seventy-seven percent, and uh, the median the median score was thirty-six out of forty-four. It's 82%, okay? You deserve the best from your device? Skip. So, uh, let's see if the pen's working. 
Oh, just, it's great. Now it's working. Okay. So if you want to see your exam, I mean, this, this is totally unique times, right? Um, so the, the exams are with my teaching assistant and I'll, so I'm going to post the solutions and everything so you can like look at that and see, kind of get an idea of where, what you might have missed. But if you want to look specifically at different things, uh, we can arrange that. And, and I'm going to think of a procedure to do that. But probably what it's going to be is you can set up a WebEx meeting with our TA and he'll individually go through the exam with you. But I don't want to use too much time here, but just know that you're definitely going to be able to look at it and, um, okay. Overhaul, I'm going to just mute you. Okay. Okay. So that's enough about the exam for now. Let's talk about this regulator problem a little bit. We're going to look first at the single input, single output case. So this means one input, one output. So we're going to have a, a reference signal. So in general, In general, you're going to have a reference signal R of K. So it can change like each step, right? Um, we know that uh, for this regulator problem, we're just going to set this reference to zero. But before we do that, the, the error The output error, just like when we've done control before, it's going to be the difference between the reference and like this output of your system because you want your output to be the same as the reference. So for the regulator problem, RK is just zero for all time. And so what that means for the error is that it's just going to be minus yk. Now here's where our state space model comes in. Because we know that y is equal to C matrix, which is your output matrix, times your state vector, plus your D matrix times your input. And I'm not putting a line under this input because we just have one input. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the single input, single output case. Now, usually the D matrix is zero. So this is, this is called our direct transmission matrix. And this is only non-zero if your output is somehow directly proportional to the input. But, but usually it's not. So we're going to assume it's just 0. And so this means that our output error is just going to be minus c times xk. So the error at step k is this. Now obviously we want this error to go to 0. go to zero. In other words, the limit as k goes to infinity of our error, we want that to be zero. Now, because the error is proportional to um, 
our states here. You know, it's just the C matrix times our states. This implies that our states also go to zero. Limit as k goes to infinity, xk equals zero. And I'm going to put a line under it because you might have a couple states. Even though you have one output, the state vector might be like more than one. Um, so this is going to be a vector full of zeros because we want our states to go to zero. Now, the way this happens, let's look at the dynamics of x. We, we, show, we showed you this last time. This is just your standard discrete time state space equation. xk is your A matrix times your previous states plus your B matrix times your previous control input. And once again, we're just looking at the single input k, so I didn't put a line under u. There's just a scalar number for u at each time instant. Now, how can x go to 0 with this equation? So, what we do, so I'll just show you this right now, and we'll keep using this later. Okay. First, we choose some target poles and we'll call them Z, Z star and there might be um, so I'm, I'm making it a vector because there might be a couple now what these target poles are these so what, what do poles tell you they tell you like the settling time of a system they tell you if you have, if you have oscillations and whatever so if we're choosing target poles we're choosing how quickly this system is going to go to zero, which is our goal. Um, now, for state space, poles are the same as the eigenvalues of the A matrix, okay? So effectively, we're saying like, I want this to go to zero, and I want it to do it in a way that I prescribe according to these poles. Um, and, and what that translates to in this equation is I'm trying to change the eigenvalues of the A matrix. But the A matrix is what it is. Um, we're going to start an example today where we derive an A matrix. Like if you model some system, it's kind of like your, your plant uh, like we use the transfer function g of z to represent the plant. It's kind of, you have a system and it is what it is. So here's the, here's the trick. You're going to set our control input in this equation equal to minus k. And this k is called your gain matrix. So it's a matrix, and it's multiplied by your states at x, k minus 1. This right here is the essence of state feedback control. Like, th this equation implies feedback. It's saying your control input is a function of your states. Let me show you what this does if you substitute this into the equation above. It's going to change that equation. Now it's going to be x at k is a times x k minus 1. And I'm just going to do this. It's going to be minus b times k times x k minus 1. 
So I'm just substituting that expression for u into that x equation. And now this right-hand side is only in terms of x. Okay, minus 1. So like I said, we can't change the eigenvalues of A, but by making the control input a function of the states, this is effectively like a new A matrix. So I'm going to call this A closed loop. And it's effectively what your A matrix becomes when we have this feedback from our control input. And here's the point, the eigenvalues of this will be Z star, the stuff that we choose. And that's how this works in a nutshell. So the, the trick here is we need to calculate the gain matrix K to make this work out. And it's, it's similar to choosing, like when we're doing the root locus control method, we designed a controller D of Z, and we have to choose the zeros, we have to choose the poles of that uh, controller, and we also have to choose like the gain of that controller. In state feedback, calculating this gain matrix is like the analogous procedure to that. But... The nice thing is calculating this gain matrix is a lot easier than calculating the poles and zeros of your uh, D of Z. So I'll just say this is generally easier than... Uh, doing root locus. So that's one of the many benefits of state feedback. So I just wanted to introduce this idea of state feedback in a nutshell. It may not make tons of sense right now, but we're just going to keep driving it home with examples. So what I wanted to start I have to end a little early, but with the next 15 minutes, I want to start an example. And we're going to start right from the beginning of our own regulator problem. So let me tell you what that's all about. I'm going to draw a little line off to the side so I don't start creeping this text over to the right. The example we're going to do is balancing a pendulum on a cart. And so we just want to regulate it so that it's pointing straight up, it's balancing. So our goal for the next 15 minutes is to derive a model. So it's kind of fun. Example. Regulation of inverted pendulum. You're going to have to draw today. Is there a way to download these videos? 
They're up on Twitch, so you can watch them on the videos tab. I can download the videos. Uh, I don't think you can, but I, I yeah, I plan on downloading these videos just to have them on record. But for now, you can just go to Twitch TV to watch them. Okay, so follow along and draw this. So imagine this. There's like um, a rail, and then we're going to put this cart on the rail. And then we're going to have the, the inverted pendulum. It's going to be like a pin joint right here. And I'm just going to say it's like a uniform rod that's just pinned right there. So it can rotate about that joint. So the distance of the cart from like this fixed point over here, let's call it X naught, all right? And the angle of this pendulum, we're going to call it theta. And let's say that the center of this rod, the center of mass, is like right at the middle. And I also want to track the position of that relative to this like fixed point. So this is going to be x, like the horizontal location of the center mass of the pendulum. Okay, so let's let's define some parameters. Let's say the length of the pendulum L, let's just say it's like half a meter. So the length of that half a meter. And let's say the moment of inertia about its center of gravity I'll call it J it's 1 12th ml squared so that's like standard for a uniform cylinder rod 1 12th ml squared about the CG and um, All right, let's talk about the control a little bit. So my output, what I'm going to be measuring is, we'll call it Y, and we're going to say that we have a rotary encoder at the base, at this pin joint, and it's measuring the angle. So that's very doable. And this is what our control input is. We're going to say that we control the acceleration of the cart at the bottom. So maybe I have like a, a stepper motor that has um, that's attached to like a pulley system that pulls this cart back and forth, and I can regulate the acceleration of that stepper motor so that I can pull this back and forth. So that's my control ability. All right, so now. We're going to start building a model for this. And when you do a model the way I'm doing it, so I'm starting from first principles using physics, this is in continuous time. Now, we're doing discrete time controls. So down the line, I'm going to have to convert this to a discrete time model. So just keep that in mind. All right. So let's let's build this model. 
the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do the sum of forces on this rod in the horizontal direction. So like the x direction. Now by Newton's laws, the mass of the rod times the acceleration of its center of mass is going to be equal to the sum of forces along that direction. So let's call it like fx. So what that is, that's whatever force, because I mean the only force that's being transmitted to this rod is happening right here at the pin joint. Like when I move the cart to the right, the base of that pendulum is feeling a force f of x and it's causing it to like tip one direction okay the next thing I'm going to do I'm going to do the sum of torques on the rod about its CG so about the very center So like this horizontal force at the bottom, it generates a torque about that center that makes it want to like turn. But we also can't forget um, gravity. But gravity acts at the, at the center of this thing. So it doesn't generate a torque. When I did these notes myself, I had it generating a torque at the very top. But that's not right. All right. So here's Newton's laws for a rotational body. You're going to have the moment of inertia about the CG times its angular acceleration has to be equal to the sum of torques. So we're going to have this force acting on the bottom and its perpendicular moment arm to the CG would be L over 2 cosine of theta. All right. Now, I need another equation because... Um, in the end, I'm going to turn this second equation into a state space model, but I need the input to show up in here. So the way we're going to do this, I need to do, um, give some kinematic relationships specifically, I need how X is related to my uh, X naught and theta. So if you were to look at the geometry up there, x would be x naught minus L over 2 sine theta. This is going to help us out. And then I'm going to need to take the time derivatives of this. So like x dot would be x naught dot minus L over 2 theta dot cosine of theta. Derivatives like that always trip me up a little bit. Plus 
L over two squared. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to assume that theta is a small angle. So we're going to assume that if our controller is working, this thing's never going to tip over very much. So if we assume theta is small, then we can use um, like cosine theta if it's a small angle. This is going to be zero, or wait, it'll be one, sorry. Because like cosine of zero degrees is one. Um, you've probably seen this before. Sine of theta for a small theta in radians is approximately equal to theta. And we're also going to assume that theta dot squared is approximately zero. Because if theta dot is small, then theta dot squared would also be small. So I guess I should say here that we're also assuming th theta dot is small. These are all simplifications that you can get away with sometimes. But it, for our purposes, it makes it's going to make our equation into a linear one. So if I use those assumptions, x double dot is this minus L over 2 theta dot. And that last term just goes away. Wouldn't sine theta be 0? No. Nope. Equal to theta. Google small angle assumption. You'll see that like for angles less than 10 degrees in radians, sine theta is basically theta, not 0. Okay. So I'm going to take this, and this is going to help me get an expression for fx. Well, like up above, fx is going to be the mass times this expression for x double dot, which is x double dot naught minus L over 2 theta double dot. And then I'm going to sub this expression for f of x in here. So i theta double dot is equal to m x naught. So now our input acceleration is related to theta, which we want to control. Theta double dot. And then we should multiply this by L over 2 cosine theta. But I'm going to use the small angle approximation here as well. And this is, I'm going to say it's 1. OK. So let's simplify this a little bit. I'm going to have I plus, so I'm moving this theta double dot term over to the other side, I plus ML squared over 4 theta double dot. So, are we not including gravity because of the small angle approximation? Well, the thing is, gravity acts at the center of mass of the beam. So, oh, I need the L over 2 here. So, if the force is acting at the center, it can't generate a torque about the center. 
So this will be M L over two. Thank you, Danny. Is that right? Plus ML squared over four equals X naught. And that gravity thing tripped me up uh, yesterday when I was going through this. Okay. Let's, let's leave this right here. Um, because I, I have to run a little bit early today. But I wanted to, to go through this because some of you had asked me about modeling and like how do we start with a model and then uh, go to like a transfer function or a discrete time system so that we can control it. And I thought this is like the perfect time to do it because this model, it's relatively simple compared to other things we can do. And it's perfect for the regulator problem because it's just trying to keep this thing straight up. So like the next thing I'm going to do when we revisit this, I'm going to turn it into a continuous time state space model. And then once you have a continuous time state space model, it's really easy to convert it to a discrete time state space model. That's another benefit of using state space. It's really easy to uh, transform between continuous and discrete time models. It's not as easy with uh, Z transform transfer functions. Um, but uh, so we'll, we'll use this as like our toy problem to go through the regulator problem. So sorry that I got to run early. I'm going to come back for We'll hold office hours today at 3. Um, so if you have questions for me about Project 1 or anything else, or if you just want to hang out, you're welcome to do that. And um, in the meantime, I'm going to put on some music. And we're going to phase out. Thank you guys a lot for your attention. I love hanging out with you every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, I know times are weird, but I hope you're doing well. Just keep at it one day at a time. All right, see you later, guys.